Nearly 30 years ago, not long after I started out in my conservation career, world leaders gathered in Rio de Janeiro for what was dubbed the Earth Summit. Two cornerstones of international environmental policy were born out of that event, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. At the time, these new commitments brought great optimism as ambitious plans and targets laid out a vision for a world that was less polluted, richer in wildlife and fairer for people. Now, 30 years on, as I read about the state of nature, I often feel that the optimism that I felt then was misplaced. A recent review attributed biodiversity declines in Europe to the loss and fragmentation of habitats. Even when protected by law, areas set aside for nature are often small and disconnected, making them costly to protect and manage and vulnerable to climate change. But there is another way. For some time now, it has been recognised that environmental actions need to work at landscape scale. This allows natural processes like floods, fire and wind to work with keystone species like large herbivores to create diverse, dynamic and resilient ecosystems. We also know that we've lost far too much of our wildlife. It's no longer enough just to save the nature we have left. We must also restore it to places where it has been lost. These principles of restoring lost nature and working at landscape scale underpin the work of the Endangered Landscapes Programme. Through its projects, a revival is starting to happen. Species are returning to places where they haven't been seen for hundreds of years. Ecosystems are becoming more resilient to climate change. Local economies are being renewed. The exciting, ambitious, landscape scale projects like the ones you're about to hear from are restoring my optimism for the future. We are here at the foot of the Fagadash Mountains in the Romanian Carpathians, which form one of the last unfragmented mountain landscapes in Europe, home to a grand variety of species, including Europe's largest populations of large carnivores. In the past decades, however, especially after the restitution of nationalized land back to the former owners, legal and illegal logging have caused massive clear cuts in some areas, sadly sometimes not even stopping at Europe's last virgin forests. At the same time, even though almost all the original wildlife species are still present here, they have suffered from poaching and overhunting, and two of the key species, the European bison and beaver, are missing since centuries. With this project, our mission is to contribute to the conservation and restoration of these natural ecosystems for the benefit of both biodiversity and local communities. Throughout the past 10 years, we already restored over 700 hectares of clear cuts. And with the Endangered Landscapes program, we got the opportunity to continue this absolutely crucial work. So in spring and autumn 2020, we managed to replant over 350,000 saplings in some of the most difficult mountain areas and despite the very complicated situation during the pandemic. This not only creates new forests with a very natural species composition, but it also holds erosion on the slopes and reduces the risk of floods in the villages at the foot of the mountains and in the long run contributes to mitigate climate change. On top, this also provides jobs and income opportunities for local people. Usually more than 200 people from the local villages are involved in the replanting and the nursing of the saplings. Within our project, we have leased four hunting concessions covering an area of over 65,000 hectares in order to enhance wildlife numbers, but also to create a model area for human wildlife coexistence and to reintroduce the missing species. The European bison is a species that has tremendous impact on uh, the ecosystem by keeping small areas open, maintaining a mosaic structure in the forest, and also by creating niches for several other species. In November 2019, we brought the first bison from Poland and Germany into an acclimatization enclosure in the eastern Fagarasz Mountains, from where we released them into the wild in spring 2020. And it was really fascinating to see how well this small herd of eight bison adapted to the new environment um, using an area of over 10,000 hectares. And as a proof and um, a real highlight, in autumn 2020, the first bison calf was born in the Fagarash Mountains, the first 
reproduction after uh, the species absence for over 200 years. So now we'll keep supplementing the number of bison year after year, and we will keep monitoring them constantly to ensure the sustainability of the species in the area. What really makes me optimistic is to see the recovery and rewilding of the forest, allowing it to grow to its full ecological function and potential, and also to see the return of the European bison, this magnificent species that will contribute massively in shaping the landscape for biodiversity once again. My name is Zafer Kazilkaya. I am a marine conservationist and founder of Mediterranean Conservation Society. We are in Gökova Bay Marine Protected Area in southwestern Turkey. This part of the Mediterranean coastline is one of the most exploited and overfished seas on the planet. These waters are home to several endangered species including the Mediterranean monk seal, sandbar shark, and dusky grouper. In 2008, research in Gökova Bay found that the fish biomass is lower than any other area in the Mediterranean, with almost no top predators, which are the sign of a healthy marine environment. To tackle marine ecosystem degradation, declining fish diversity, and associated losses to fishermen's income, the Mediterranean Conservation Society created a network of no fishing zones in Gyokoa Bay Special Environment Protection Area. We develop a community ranger program to encourage more effective patrolling of no-take zones and enforcement of existing fisheries legislation. Through this and other programs, we conduct continuous research to record and monitor ecosystem restoration and collaborate local fishing cooperatives to monitor fish stocks. Thanks to our collaborative efforts, today fish stocks are growing tenfold in protected areas and small-scale fishery incomes have increased by more than 300% compared to 2010. The health of the ecosystem is not only beneficial for humans and the livelihoods of fishers, but improved fish stocks also mean increased availability of prey for monk seals and other endangered predatory marine species. We can see that these habitat restoration efforts are leading to increasing reproduction rates among monk seals through the video footage from cameras located inside of breeding and resting caves. Thanks to the support of the Endangered Landscape Program, we are currently expanding this successful model across a 500-kilometer coastal area that is home to a multitude of habitats in need of urgent protection and management. I am optimistic because the expanded network of ecologically connected marine protected areas enables protection and restoration of coastal ecosystems with increasing resilience to current and future threats. Danube Delta is one of the largest wilderness areas in Europe. It has undergone a lot of changes in the 20th century. Huge areas were converted to agriculture, large agricultural boulders. Many of the large herbivores and animals disappeared from the delta as a result of hunting, poaching, and again, expansion of agriculture. At the end of the 20th century, most of these practices have collapsed, and many of the agricultural areas were abandoned. Uh, with the decline of uh, large herbivores and decline of uh, cattle farming, the impact of grazing animals has diminished in the delta and many of the areas were left without large herbivores. We know that large herbivores are very important elements of the landscape. We call them architects of the landscapes. They open up the areas, they create mosaic habitats that are important for birds, for mammals, for fish. So in the Danube Delta project we try to bring back these key important processes. The first important process of course is reconnecting the floodplain back to the Danube Delta. And we've made al already a lot of very important steps in this. For instance, 10 dams were removed in one of the tributaries of the Danube Delta. And what we've seen in spring is amazing return of water and, and the nature in this landscape. We will continue monitoring the results or impacts of the dam removal in the delta. We continue removing the dikes and the boulders in the delta and bring back the large herbivores. An example of this is Yermakov Island, which is one of our key hotspots for rewilding and for restoration of wetlands. The area has been reflooded by 
dike removal back in 2009 and now as rewarding Europe we support these restoration of wetlands by reintroducing back the large herbivores. Last year we brought uh, herds of uh, conic horses, water buffalo and this year we were releasing two species of deer, fallow deer and red deer to complement and make the whole kind of diversity of large herbivores. And through the monitoring efforts we're looking what impact these animals actually have on the vegetation. Some tentative results of the monitoring using the satellite imagery and drone observations and field studies showed that the vegetation on the island is changing and it's moving towards more diverse habitats. Interesting things that we are discovering that the herbivores are very important to actually eradicate even invasive species. What we've seen on Yermakov is that the herbivores actually graze and damage and significantly damage and even sometimes remove the exotic species. In other parts of the delta we will be reintroducing the long extinct species, for instance like Kulan, who roamed the Danube Delta two centuries ago. And we brought them there over staying in the pre-release areas and hope the next spring the Kulan will, will composite the local grazes in, in the most terrestrial or steppe habitats that actually a significant part of the delta. We also see that these animals so far adapt very well. All the conic horses, water buffalo are in very good conditions. Places like Yermakov Island or the Outer Delta where we introduce the species are also important demonstration sites how the wilderness actually help to boost the local economies. On Yermakov Island with the local concession we're investing in infrastructure and we're looking at the business models to support the rewarding and restoration and recovery of nature. Apart from large herbivores, wars, we also introduce the other species that are lost in the delta, the important parts of the trophic chains. For instance, the eagle owls or demoiselle cranes in other parts, the more terrestrial parts of the delta. These also generate a lot of interest from the general public, uh, from the large media to the travelers who already come and, and visit the area with the hope to see these elusive animals. projects that we've just heard from are showing us just what's possible when we give nature the space to recover. They're also teaching us about how to create such transformational change and giving us all the opportunity to learn from their interventions. This is real meaningful change that's happening and because they're working at the landscape scale these projects are reversing wildlife losses sometimes bringing back species that have been missing for hundreds of years. They're removing barriers to nature's recovery and reconnecting habitats so that species can move freely and diverse ecosystems have the space to manage themselves. Crucially, they're also helping to support local, sustainable economies that are built on healthy ecosystems. Never has our reliance on a healthy environment been more apparent than during this last year as we've collectively dealt with the COVID-19 crisis. And it's become clear to us that nature doesn't just provide us with clean air, food and opportunities for carbon capture. It also gives us connection when we feel lost and solace during difficult times. It's been nearly 30 years since the Earth Summit of 1992, coincidentally the year that I was born, and now I find myself towards the beginning of my own conservation career. Looking back, I can see the foundation that conservation and environmental work before me has laid down. It's so important that we recognise the value of this conservation work, but also recognise the limitations of its impacts when we've only strived to conserve what we have left. Now is the time to be brave and have the courage to strive for a future in which we live within the planet's boundaries and give back to natural systems that have already given us so much. We need more pioneering women and men who are helping to realise this vision and forward-looking donors who share their ambitions. 2021 can be the year that we collectively recognise the true value of nature and be an opportunity for optimism as well as meaningful action. This year, world leaders will convene at global biodiversity and climate change conventions, just as they did at the Earth Summit of 92. The United Nations is also launching their UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, signalling the high level recognition of the need to reverse environmental declines. My hope is that we make the most of these opportunities. If the last 30 years have taught us anything, 
it's that talking about change and setting commitments means nothing without meaningful action. We now know what that action should look like and we've no time to lose. It is the commitment, innovation and courage of the people supported by the Endangered Landscapes programme that gives me hope for nature's recovery and our own reconnection with the environment. I'm optimistic because of the people who are brave enough to strive for real change and being able to see firsthand the revival of landscapes that are helping to create a better future for us all.